ish in general is a 40 year evolution. The technology was introduced by Gall and Purdue back in 1969, and it was using isotopic um, labels. And then eight years after that, um, Rudkin and Solar came out with a, a fish uh, method. So then uh, a lot of um, fluorescent was done, was used, and uh, since then there's been a lot of different levels of improvements. Uh, and the types of improvements really have been targeting the sensitivity and increasing sensitivity. A couple of ways to do that is um, either to amplify the RNA target, so there are more targets to look at. So pre-hybridization, you can use um, PCR to amplify your RNA targets. However, uh, in, in the process, there's some amplification biases, so it doesn't lend itself very well to quantitation uh, processes downstream from that. Other methodologies such as uh, TSA and bench DNA-ish, uh, as well as uh, rolling circle amplification, uh, uh, amplify the signals after hybridization event. Um, but all of that uh, can also increase the noise as well. So when you're amplifying signals, of course, with the background noise being there, that will also get amplified. So in 2010, RNA scope was introduced, and our team really wanted to address those issues. Uh, is there a way to increase the sensitivity, but in the meantime, also to suppress the background noise? I just have a minute here for the slides to catch up. Okay. So the goal for our R&D team is really to introduce a technology that increases um, both the sensitivity but um, really drive down the background noise and, and ensure that uh, nonspecific hybridization does not get amplified. Uh, what the team was able to, to measure was a net increase of 400-fold in signal-to-noise ratio. The entire process can be done within a seven, eight hour single day uh, process and begins with some pretreatment to cells or tissues and then hybridizing of the target probes that we design and produce onto the um, tissues or cells. And then after the hybridization process, then the amplification with either chromogenic or fluorescent uh, labels are used. And then after that, it's just visualization with microscopes. And we also have worked with uh, Delphinian to come up with a automated way to quantify the signal so that you can get automated um, processing of those signals for your chromogenic assays, for a single color assays. And what we are um, going to present to you is that this technology really does achieve single molecule sensitivity. It's highly specific, and it allows for single cell quantitation of gene expression. The assay is extremely universal, and I'll explain what that means, um, as well as rapid and scalable. Okay, really going back to how does the technology work, it's the RNA scope probe design uh, that is the key. And what we use is it's called double Z probe design. And um, so the base of the Z is uh, there are three components to the Z. The upper region is a 14 base tail sequence. And that upper region is where the preamplifier and the cascade of amplifications will occur. A spacer is really just a, a, a molecular spacer that we have. And the other business end of the um, Z is the lower region. And this lower region contains 18 to 25 base sequence that is specific to your target. How we use the Z is not as a single Z, but pairs of Z. So the pairs of Z on the upper end will provide a 28 base region for the pre-amplifier. Target specific binding site is between 36 and 50 bases long. And again, it's both a Z binding that uh, adjacent to each other onto your target sequence. The inch line that I have here represents your RNA, and your RNA is completely intact. Then, you know, hybridize our, the assay would hybridize up to 20 pro pairs to your RNA. But we understand that, especially in cancer, many of your samples are um, FFPE, and there's uh, some degradation to your RNA, so the RNA can be very fragmented. The, the simplicity of this design and the short probes, the relatively short probes of the binding site uh, to the target enables for our uh, probes to even to degrade RNA. And what we've uh, also demonstrated in a lot of experiments or our scientists have demonstrated 
it is we just need three pairs of Z to bind to the target in order to see um, signal. And so if you have degraded RNA or fragmented RNA, they really are not likely to have migrated and they're still localized to each other. So even with fragmented RNA, you should still see a single amplification signal for a single molecule. Okay. Again, three Z pairs are needed. Okay, how does the uh, assay work? Um, this is just an illustration, but you have your target transcript and the probes are added, and then the double Zs land uh, adjacent to each other, and the pre-amplifier will then bind uh, to the top region. Again, 28 bases are used for binding there. Each pre-amplifier then will serially get 20 amplifiers bind to that pre-amplifier. When each amplifier, there are 20 label probes. We do this 20 times. So what this means is we see 20 Z pairs with 20 amplifiers and 20 labels. That's an 8,000 labeled molecule reactions per single target. And each target is roughly 1 kb. And so experiments were also done because, of course, naturally the, the question is, what about nonspecific binding? What happens if you have a single Z binding? to a non-target RNA. Well, experiments uh, were done by our scientists to demonstrate um, that actually the pre-amplifiers cannot bond or cannot be stable onto just 14 bases uh, of the upper region. Um, so the non-specific binding that may occur uh, does not get amplified, so we really are suppressing that level of background noise. Okay, so how did we prove this or how did the research team uh, um, uh, demonstrate this, validate this design strategy. A couple of, of experiments uh, that we'll highlight here. In panel A, you okay. will see a very green signal. And the green signal is actually our experiment where our scientists can show that uh, used um, a 16 amp or it's four pre amplifiers. Each of the pre amplifiers have four amplifiers on top of it. With that, experiment, we can see that the signal is quite strong, and we can signal for that. Compared to that, you can look at panel B, where our scientists use a single preamp and a single amp. As you do see a very, very, very slight uh, amplification, but it's so close to our negative um, uh, probe side that it really is, would not be considered as signal. However, when measuring, we can really see that there is an a uh, 16-fold increase in signal intensity on the A side, so it correlates with our 16-fold amplification. Okay, we wanted to uh, uh, guarantee, uh, wanted to ensure that the specificity is there, and so back again about the, um, the left Z and right Z. If we were to just bind just the left Z alone, in, uh, so as in experiment C, there you can see when using just the left Z alone, you don't see any green signals. And the right Z alone, NOD, we also don't see any signals. And E, that is our negative control, um, just 18S uh, sense probe. Okay, additional experiments were also used to demonstrate uh, specificity. Again, this is detailed in the Wang paper, um, so you can uh, find more information about that. But uh, experiments were done with HCV. Um, green signals were used, uh, green, green probes were used, um, and we can see the HCV labels in infected cells, and in non-infected cells there were no signals. Okay, uh, many of you would consider, um, are there ways of um, using this for more than one RNA species? Uh, species? And we actually have two methods in doing that. Uh, fluorescent assay we can do, we can um, combine up to four targets into a single assay, so that's using the label probes that are fluorescent, so we're not limited by number of targets that we can um, target. However, because of the fluorescent dye and the overlaps, for what we can uh, can do with uh, with that level of, of signals. Um, if you were interested in pooling samples, we also have that approach, and it's very well used within our assay, especially for HPV, where uh, scientists are just looking for, is there a present of the high-risk or low-risk um, um, So we can 
pull up to 10 targets into a single pool, use the same tail, and uh, target those um, species. Okay, here is uh, one of our images for what it looks like when you use a multiplex strategy using our fluorescent dye. Again, this is very detailed in our Wang paper from 2012. Just for my slide to catch up. Okay, many of you are considering what what about chromogenic RNA scope assay compared to the additional non isotopic ish. I see that there's a delay, um, so you're not quite seeing my slide just yet. I'll, I'll just give it a minute. Okay, we can see it now, I think, hopefully that you can too on the phone. Uh, Dr. Jake S. says from uh, NCI did this experiment and shared data with us. He is an expert in the uh, conventional non-isotopic-ish, and he studies SIV, and um, he had some data that showed him, uh, you know, it, it was very uh, ambiguous as to the presence of SIV and using our technology and using our uh, red chromogenic assay we can see that there are very strong signals and uh, measure um, about a hundredfold more sensitive than the conventional non-isotopic-ish. Uh, Dr. Jake Estes actually has quite a few papers. I believe the latest one was in April of this year using our technology. So if you're interested in seeing how this lab applies and, and um, uh, for, uh, for data that's used uh, within IV, you can um, look up the Estes lab. So we can see punctate dots uh, as signals. Wow, the guys are really slow in, in showing up, so I think I need to just get a little bit because the images are so heavy. Okay, I can see it now. So part of the validation process of the um, RNA scope technology, our scientists also measure the uh, expansion. Are, are each punctate uh, dot really a single uh, RNA molecule. Uh, lots of experiments were done to demonstrate this, um, but here I'll highlight one experiment in particular using HER2, which was labeled in green. You can see that the um, 18S uh, is uh, labeled in red and DAPI for the nucleus. Uh, about 100 cells were used here where we count, uh, our scientists counted up the expression and seeing each dot, and uh, the, the um, results were roughly seven, uh, 14, cell, 14 RNA molecules uh, of HER2 were found per cell. Same culture, uh, quantizing was also used, so an in-solution method was used to measure as well, and uh, using that method, uh, the results were roughly 17 molecules per cell. So uh, we really have demonstrated that the, both methods are very uh, are highly correlated in terms of um, the ability to detect at the single molecule level. But then in everyday use, uh, it would be painful to have to quantify, quantify manually. So we have worked with a company called Delphinian and they have developed um, their software to work with our assay. So for chromogenic brown and chromogenic red, you are able to use RNA scope spot studio software to automate this quantitation process. And the software is really nice in demonstrating and, uh, and identifying each cell, but also um, binning each cell into the different levels of expression. On the right side here, you you can see that each cell has been identified and uh, given a number, a number of spots that were estimated uh, per cell. Okay. What do I mean by the software, uh, the assay being a universal assay? Um, this, this product, this um, technology is really very applicable to any gene that you might uh, be interested in uh, from any species as long as there's a DNA sequence to it, and it really can be applied to any type of tissue. Um, if we do not have a probe that you're interested in, we can manufacture, we can de both design and manufacture within two weeks. Today we offer over 5,000 probes in our catalog, and that's really a 100%, 125% increase from the previous year. 
and we've been for over 25 species. We have cancer probes, stem cell probes, neural, and so on. And non-coding, of course, is also a very popular way of uh, interrogating non-coding RNA using our technology. Some images uh, using Leica um, to generate. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm waiting for slide to load. But the Bond RX is one of the automated uh, assays that we uh, offer. Uh, we offer RNA scope assay on the automated system, and here you will find that um, we've done experience across mouse um, tissues in intestines, lung, and spleen, colon, and so on, and the experiment does work. Um, I'm sorry for the delay. Just heavy images, I guess. So you can see this is our red assay, red chromogenic assay. Okay, I'll give that one minute. Okay, our assay is extremely rapid and scalable. What I mean by that is we have manual assays available for chromogenic brown, red, duplex, as well as multiplex. I'll give a minute. I'm sorry, to, this is really just catching up. But if you're not interested in doing manual assays and need the assay to be uh, used, especially in uh, pathology labs and, and larger labs where you're processing hundreds of samples, we offer an assay on uh, the Leica uh, system, on the Bond RX, as well as on Ventana's discovery platforms. And the first three steps, the pretreatment, the hybridization, and the amplification processes, those are automated, and then you would then take the slides um, off and visualize. On the Leica side, the loading process to put slides in and re reagents in, it's a 15, 15 minutes, and then you walk away, and then you come back uh, 10 hours later, and the slides are completed. Okay, beyond doing the assays yourself, um, uh, Advanced Diagnostics also offer a full-service assay development services, so you can just send us your samples, you can um, discuss with our team, um, especially about your uh, experiment, and then we will uh, perform the analysis and send out the slides back to you along with a report fully detailed on what the findings are. Those are all three options that are available. Okay, uh, questions that we usually get around the assay are, does one not really correlate to a single molecule? Yes, it does, and again, it's uh, well documented in, in, in our paper. Um, and visualization does require three pairs of Z to bind, and so typically for a normal target, we design 20 pairs of Z, each pair using about 50 basis, so that's one KB that we design to. The shortest that we can design is 300 basis, so for special cases where you would like to uh, target an, an RNA where you only have uh, about 300 bases, we can do that. Uh, again, we, can, we would, in that case, design as few as six uh, Z pairs. Again, we need three Z pairs to bind, so we really don't address um, any targets that are shorter than 300 bases. Many of you are interested in microRNA, uh, which RNA scope 2.0 is not suitable for at this time. Um, all the questions that normally come up are, what about isoforms? And uh, we can design for isoforms, as long, given that there are 300 unique bases that are available to distinguish itself from other isoforms. Again, two-week process. So if you're in, interested in checking out our probe list, again, we have 5,000 probes. There's an automatic way for you to check. You can enter the name of your gene, and we can. Um, our uh, database should uh, provide you an answer with how many probes are available. If they're not available, you can request for a new or custom probe. And um, again, it's a two-week process for us uh, to get new, new probes. Uh, again, I hope to convince you that um, the assay is um, ideal for cancer research um, due to the single um, molecule sensitivity and specificity, which is important in cancer for, uh, for detecting low abundance uh, transcripts. Single cell quantitation is uh, important, but we know that it's, it's really molecular uh, along with the morphological context that many of you are looking for in order to interrogate tumor heterogeneity, uh, either intratumor or intertumor, as well as tumor environment. Against any gene, any species, any tissue, we pretty much can design. So if your experiments, uh, if there are no 
device available for your target, we can address that. But as well, you may be using RNA-seq and discovering new biomarkers. If you're already discovering them in the RNA format, you might as well keep them in, and you should keep them in on the RNA format for validation purposes because uh, RNA and protein expressions don't always correlate. Um, so um, we, we would definitely recommend an RNA scope approach. Um, again, the, pro the um, extremely rapid and scalable, and if you're not interested in doing the experiments yourself, you can send it in to us. So um, that's kind of the summary of RNA scope assay. Are there questions that are specific to the assay itself? So let us know. Okay, we said no questions are in, but if there are questions arise, please type in and we can address them at the end of uh, Dr. Palanisamy's presentation. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker. Again, he is at the Henry Ford Health uh, System. He is a longtime researcher within the cancer arena. Many of you are very familiar with his work on RNA fusion genes, and uh, prostate cancer in particular has been a high-level focus uh, for him. Uh, he is going to discuss a paper that is using I IHC along with RNA scope I say, to detect uh, ETV1, 4, and 5, which are gene fusions within prostate cancer. His team was able to use this combined IHC and RNA scope ish approach to discover some very rare uh, subclasses of prostate cancer. Uh, and this publication just came out in September, and I will hand it over to the speaker. <laughs> Second, as I pass you the ball. Did you grab it? I can't seem to grab it. Okay. Thank you. Quinn, thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind introduction of myself and about the RNA ish technology. And I would also like to thank all the participants who are able to join for this uh, webinar. Uh, I apologize for the change in the date. Uh, some important things I have to change today. <clears throat> so, what I would like to do today is in the rest of 30 minutes that is available to me. Talk about the accelerating tumor heterogeneity in state cancer uh, by combining the DHC and also using the ACD bios novel RNA in situ hybridization method. The outline of my talk uh, the application of this ACD bios RNA is technology for the detection of H gene fusions in prostate cancer, uh, because I have been working on prostate cancer for the last seven years. So my talk will be more restricted only uh, uh, with the regard to prostate cancer. So to show you some data uh, that are actually already in public literature. Dr. Nami, I think we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, so maybe if you can um, be closer to the mic. I, I know you're using your computer. Hello, are you still on the line? Uh-oh. I hear you. Oh, no. He's on Yes. That's enough. Now, I cannot hear you at all, so I'm not sure what's going on with the sound system for you. Mm 
can see your desktop, but we don't see your presentation as well. We now see your presentation, but we can't hear you. I'm not sure what's going on, but we cannot do at all. Would it be possible for you to use the phone conference uh, number to call in? Yes, I think what you can do is also click. If you go back to the WebEx uh, Event Center and click on the phone button. I see you now. We hear you now. Got it? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what what happened, but uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you start again with that your 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 first slide with the experiment? Yeah. So here, the outline of my talk is going to be on the application of RNA technology for the discovery of S gene fusions in prostate cancer. Also, I will show you how we can, uh, by combining uh, uh, IHC and the RNA, we identify some molecular substance uh, in prostate cancer. So, interrupts. I believe the sharing mechanism has been turned off or something. So, if you go uh, to the upper center and, uh, and click on Share My Desktop. Yeah. Now? Yes, yes, it's refreshing now. The keyboard, I think there is something else. So I, I stop using my keyboard. I will try to use the mouse. Okay, thank you. Okay. So I'm able to see the here, me now? Yes, positive. Oh, great. So, the prostate cancer classification, as you see, uh, I think traditionally uh, the scoring pattern is being used uh, for classification of the prostate cancer. Of course, it reveals the heterogeneity of the tumor at the morphological level. But recently, with the discovery of uh, several molecular markers, uh, which uh, actually enable the community to classify uh, the prostate cancer for the first time in distinct molecular subsets based on the molecular aberrations, but the ETS gene fusions and the, the presence of the overexpression of SPINK1 in a subset of ETS fusion negative prostate cancer, and uh, my study on the discovery of RAF kinase gene fusions in a small subset of prostate cancer. So, of, of course, these molecular markets are not uh, particularly associated directly with the particular Gleason pattern, but they are actually very well demonstrated for the presence uh, only in the tumor but in the benign prostate. So it is not only the discovery of the molecular markers, and now the recent work has demonstrated that these molecular markers can be targeted with the specific inhibitors. Like S G fusions can be targeted with the PARP inhibitors uh, because S V arrangements are associated with the DNA uh, instability and the chromosomal uh, breakage. And really the spin one expressed cases can be targeted with the EGF inhibitors. I think uh, I have given the references. If anyone needs more details, please refer those articles because with the essence of time, I may not be able to go through the details. And similarly, the RAF kinase gene fusions can be targeted with the RAF and the MEK inhibitors. And also recently, just last week, there is another paper that was published that is uh, because ETS gene fusions being transcription factors, they cannot be directly targeted. But this work showing that it's a small molecule inhibitor that can be used to target the ETV1. They showed it by using the mouse genograph model. So the this of distinct molecular markers in state cancer and the availability of specific inhibitors for each markers. So it is time for to develop uh, a best and a reliable diagnostic methods for the accurate of these molecular markers at the diagnostic um, biopsies. So here we have, one can use either PCR or FISH <laughs> or IHC methods to detect individual markers. 
show you how, how uh, using the organization ISC, we have developed some new approaches for the direction of these molecular markers, high specificity and the sensitivity. Okay. So this is the scheme, uh, like a decision tree, where if you have the initial biopsy, either it is a nasal biopsy or prostatectomy, uh, from the top, <coughs> I start. So we get the biopsy, the pathologies, do the conventional morphological analysis to see whether there is a character or it is completely normal. And sometimes in the diagnostic biopsy samples, if it is needle biopsy, it may be difficult for a pathologist to diagnose even a small tumor fossa, whether it is a tumor or normal for that some AMACR and the cytocorrective markers are used uh, to to resolve uh, those issues. So what is confirmed <coughs> the sample has tumor and we can systematically profile the tumor for the presence of these molecular markers and so on the frequency of these molecular markers. <coughs> and so the ERG uh, is the more predominant model which is present in about 50% percent of uh, prostate cancer for this pink one uh, etv1 four and five are present in a lower frequency so for earth and spink one there are good antibodies available which can be detected the isc uh, as an option <coughs> the earth positive cases can be confirmed by fish for the percent of uh, whether the five relation or <laughs> the rearrangement if these cases are negative for either earth or spink one <coughs> We can do the ETB1, ETB45, or BRAF by fish because uh, for these uh, genes, there is no good antibody is available. So here I will show you if you want to do individually these markers, uh, it is time consuming, laborious, and it may be very highly expensive. So I have to, and also we will encounter some of some of the relations of the availability of tumor here. We may not have enough number of slides between all these markers. So to all these issues, we have developed a new approach where we can actually come back, uh, and develop a duplex or the uh, multiplex uh, assays for the reliable production of these markers. So on the right, I will show you the first approach where we since and Pink one only uh, account for about 50 to 60 percent of the prostate cancer because uh, they are present in high frequency in prostate cancer. We developed a dual ISC <coughs> combining the earth and spink one. The one outlier expression is uh, we know that it is occurring in a subset of its negative prostate cancer. As just before, it may be a therapeutic target. And we need a method for easy and rapid detection of this marker so that we can stratify the patients based on the marker patients because they are associated with aggressive prostate cancer. And the earth and spink one being the two major molecular operations compared to ETV1, 4, 5, and the rapid infusions. So in screening for these markers, we have identified majority prostate cancer patients who would undergo an aggressive approach. So that you add and spring one day to develop uh, <coughs> to evaluate and spring one is that uh, we developed uh, by using the Ventana automated stain system in the area because the because of distinct localization of uh, and spring one makes this assay a high sensitive and specific to detect the subset of prostate cancer. This like <coughs> this work was published um, last year uh, in modern pathology using these two uh, distinct antibodies uh, by using the ERG, the EPR3864, and for the pink one, we use the ab novas um, multiple antibody. So next, I will show you how uh, this assay performs. Let's pink one. As you can see in the image, is one and the brown to the earth that is uh, see the heterogeneous expression of the speak one image which is a metastatic pancreatic uh, where you will see uh, one area of the tumor is positive for the speak one which is blue and the blue is the earth then you take both elegant speak one so this is used as a positive control so we use this assay to detect to scale 
in Italy or A. They found the cases where you can distinct the tumor foci. So that you will see small holes. Those are all actually punched out for making TMA, but still there are tumor areas left. Where either areas that are red are stained with the earth, and here next a, a tumor foci next to that are uh, stained with pink one that appears in brown. So now this is the first case where we see the presence of the earth and the pink one in the two independent tumor foci dealing the molecular heterogeneity. Based on the Gleason pattern, they have the same kind of Gleason score. On molecular level, they are distinct. And similarly, uh, in this image where we showed this are another case, uh, we found both Earth and Spink 1 present in the same tumor fossil. Instead of the two different types, in the same tumor fossil where you see the nuclear staining in brown and the cytoplasmic staining of Spink 1 that is a red color. So this is the first time we have to demonstrate it. The present two molecular operations, <coughs> either in the two independent tumor foci or in the same tumor foci. Okay, so there's another view. <laughs> the same thing where you see the both air and speed one here in, in the team. So, the case where you will see a large area of the tumor is very strong, uh, kind of brown staining. But the area where you will see both Earth and Spring 1 are affected in the same human process. So, this is the first time we are seeing this type of actually molecular heterogeneity uh, in prostate cancer. <coughs> uh, so, to summarize the Earth Spring 1 legacy, I want to share this assay is uh, can be done both manually and by automatic method using the maintenance system. So it's easy to perform and it's reliable, it is reproducible and it's highly sensitive to a, a small tumor foci <coughs> and can be used for routine both in the clinical and research setting. And uh, <coughs> we actually, our study confirms, uh, it was until our study, it was thought that air and skin one are mutually exclusive and it is the first time we showed that, that presence of air and skin one either in the same tumor foci are in two independent tumor foci in the prostate cancer. And the work was it's not only our work, recently there are two papers which confirm that at least about 4% of the prostate cancer are known to have the spin one and the air one positive either in the same tumor foci or two independent tumor foci. So this work signifies the importance of identification of a new molecular subset of cancer by using the dual IHC. Now, I will move on to the detection of ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5 in prostate cancer. There is no good antibody available for any of, for either of these genes. Uh, and also, a small tumor foci of cancer with different molecular mutations and that uh, we using urban spin one can be missed in the ETV1, 4, and 5 positive cases. And so far, no one has really demonstrated the tissue level expression of ETV, ETV4, and ETV5. Until uh, our work, uh, these markers were detected by using either by fish or by PCR. That's we developed this RNA is based assay. This was published recently uh, in the Applied Immunostatistics Journal. So please read this paper for more details. Here I will explain how I did it. The probes that are developed by the ACD Bio. Uh, Perds, ETV1, ETV4, ETV5. This black bar under the each gene shows the exact location where oligoprops uh, that Queen was describing uh, were actually and they are used in the cell. So, uh, we wanted to compare uh, how reliable this RNA in situ hybridization method uh, is for the detection of the Earth gene fusion. For that, initially, I did a comparative analysis using the ERB gene as a model because for us, we have a good antibody, plus I did the immunohistochemistry, and by using a consecutive section with RNA into the conversation, how the immunohistochemistry and the RNA is are comparable. <clears throat> so here is the example where we go <coughs> on the left side, the section is staying with the immunohistochemistry by using the ERB antibody. And executive section from the same patient we showed by using the ACD bios RNAH 
where the only the tumor area is strongly staining in the uh, uh, RNA, but there is no staining in the stroma or in the benign area. So what we did was we took um, about 12 ERG IC positive cases and 70 ERG negative cases. And we are able to show there is a 100% concordance between RNA and ISC. We didn't detect any false positives or the false negatives. So, which actually set the stage that uh, we thought that this is a very powerful approach that we can detect these SD infusions in positive cancer with high, high specificity and sensitivity. So, uh, with that, uh, we were able to come up uh, with a score quality as well based on the signal intensity. As you see, that actually scoring starts from 0 to 4, that being negative, and 1 uh, to 3, 4 with the increasing intensity of the RNA. So we use this based on the experimental level uh, to evaluate uh, the tumor specimens uh, for RNA ish. So I'll show you uh, one example uh, where uh, the one case that was confirmed uh, to be positive for ETB1 by fish, and when we performed the RNA, hybridization where we see that very beautiful hybridization on in the tumor area and in the benign. So very specific hybridization and this specimen was again confirmed by fish by using the breakout probe that indeed the areas are location positive. <coughs> the same um, probe uh, was actually used to screen a large TMA which can a prostate cancer. Uh, especially this particular TMA, we don't have any idea of uh, any uh, cases for ETV1. We actually blindly screened this TMA uh, for presence uh, or absence of ETV1 cases. <coughs> Out of these uh, 96 cases that are represented in this TMA, we found three cases that are clearly positive for the ETV1. Actually, three triplet cores in each case, which in the blooming view, as you can see, all three cores that are represented uh, uh, for each case were positive uh, by ATV1. Whereas uh, on the case number one, I think the first core is more benign, where you don't see any signal, and, and the second one, uh, where you see strong signal. So, in all other cases that are completely either negative. Uh, either they are cancer or benign, you don't see any even a trace level of the ETV1. So, which confirms that the staining is very specific one of the cases that are positive for the ET1 rearrangement at the DNA level. So, here's another example to show the same thing for the ETV4 probe. Here again, only the ETV4 rearrangement positive cases are pretty positive for uh, RNA. For an this is another case where we can use. Is not only for uh, the prostatectomy samples or the tissue microarray, we can do RNA ish uh, on the biopsy sample as well. So, this case, as you can see, it is highly positive, very strong positive for the ETV expression. With the RNA ish, we show specific expression of the ETV4 only in the tumor area and don't see any, not even a trace amount of uh, the staining in non specific staining in the not tumor area. So, which shows the high specificity and the sensitivity of this uh, approach. And for the ETV5 as well, we confirm the index case where you see uh, a strong staining of this red color one in the tumor area, but none in the benign or in the ETV5 rearrangement negative cases. Okay? So, it's like we have two panels, we have actually two cases. We want to confirm but there is any cross reactivity of these uh, ETV1, 4, and 5 probes because uh, the sequence is similar between the X family genes. We want to see whether uh, the cases that are positive for ETV1 in the upper panel, and the, on the left, you see that the cases positive for ET1. But same case, when we put the ETV4 and the ETV5, there is no same. So it informs that these probes are specific for a gene. And so in the lower panel, in the middle, you see uh, a case that is strong positive for ETV4, and the same case that is completely negative for ETV1 and ETV5. So, when forms the specificity uh, of the probes that we are using uh, from the ACD bio, and which will reliably detect only the rearrangement positive cases. So, rearrangement results what we did, we did an extensive screening 
RD1, 4, and 5 on a large panel of about 319 cases. <coughs> and some of the ETP1 positive and 4 positive cases. So we found that <coughs> the only the cases that are actually confirmed by FISH are possibly by NIH. But, uh, but uh, again, what we found was uh, the ETV on the ETV1 positive cases, unlike the other, the same pattern was kind of heterogeneous. Like uh, there are three cases of, that are ETV1 positive, the staining was uh, heterogeneous. It is not uniform on all the tumor. There are tumor areas that are positive for ETV1, and again, some tumor areas are negative for ETV1. And similarly, one of the ETV4 positive cases also showed heterogeneous staining. So I want you that this is the first time we are looking at the external ETV1 and ETV4 at the tissue level. And this first time we demonstrate the heterogeneous expression of these markers. So here I will show you uh, one example uh, where we show uh, the heterogeneous expression of ETV1. So this is the HIV section of the NK tumor block. And by doing the RNA uh, on the top, as you can see, more than 90 percent of the tumor area is strongly positive for ETV1, and uh, and there are small areas that are circled. They are com they are still tumor, but they are completely negative for ETV1. So it's actually initially I thought it would be some typical artifact because of some bubble or whatever it is. But repeat in additional uh, additional slides we found the same part. So out of curiosity, what I did. Uh, then we confirmed uh, the CTV1 rearrangement by FISH as well. <laughs> then, I, at university, I stained these cases with earth IHC because since large tumor area is positive for ETV1, anyone can simply ignore that, okay, this case is positive for ETV1. We don't have to do any further investigation. So that's why, uh, since we observed a small area of heterogeneity out of curiosity when we did earth IHC, what we found is that the areas that are negative for ETV1 staining are actually strongly positive for Earth. So, so this is the first time where you will see a distinct tumor foci with the two distinct edge molecular ratios. So far, we thought that the edge gene fusions are mutually exclusive in prostate cancer. Now we started seeing that actually two independent tumor foci, the same gaze and grade pattern, showing this molecular uh, aberration. So this is the first time we show this, and uh, we confirmed by fish the independent area are actually positive uh, by fish uh, for rearrangement and ETV1 rearrangement <coughs> in two distinct processes. Now this so is another case where you see a large uh, section by doing the RNA ish When you see the bottom, <coughs> all red areas are strongly positive for ETV1, and uh, on the right top corner you see when we did the uh, IAC. There are small areas that are positive for it as well. And if the zoom in view, where I will show you that there is a small uh, kind of a high in area that is strongly positive for Earth. And tumor foci, uh, uh, there is a of tumor foci right next to the high in is strongly positive for ET1. So these are actually two different uh, areas. There is the area two independent tumor foci adjacent to each other. So independent molecular ratio. So this is the first clear demonstration of the presence of two X gene fusions within the same tumor. So, so far we thought that these are all mutually exclusive, but we have clearly demonstrated uh, the presence of these two small collaborations in the same tumor foci. So here in the slide, what I'm showing is this is that you don't have to do ERG and the ETV1 uh, on two separate slides. We actually developed an approach where you can actually be doing a sequestration of RNA efficient ET RNA efficient Earth IHC. You can act and the two molecular aberrations in a on the same slide. So here, what we did was first we did the RNA ish and then we did the Earth uh, IHC. Able to see. So if you do IHC first, you may not be able to do RNA ish. So here I want to remind that. But you have to do the RNA ish, <coughs> then we can use the same slide for do <coughs> excuse me, for doing the earth IHC. So this is a very clear demonstration of the tumor heterogeneity as you can see a strong area of T positive and within the tumor there is another small foci that is completely positive for earth. 
So this is a very clear demonstration of the molecular heterogeneity of the prostate cancer, and this is emerging a new subset that's saying it. So to summarize, highlight is RNA in situ hybridization is a novel approach for the detection of SG infusions in prostate cancer because we know that SG infusions are not present in the basic tissues, and also there is no explain of either of the ERG, ET1, ETV4, or ETV5 in the induction negative cases. So because the unique expression pattern of its gene fusions in prostate cancer, I think RNA institute hybridization and combining the ISC is a very viable and novel approach, both clinical and research setting. And the earth spin one dual ISC also reveals a new subset of prostate cancer with Spring expression in the same or independent tumor foresight, which confirmed in about at least two independent studies, they confirmed that at least about 4% of the prostate cancer are known to have this dual elements. And this is the first time we showed that ETV1 and ETV4 are showing a heterogeneous expression pattern. And combining the LISC and the RNAH, we identified a new subset of prostate cancer with the dual arrangements in internet tumor for so far there's the cases that we uh, identified the earth gene derangements we identified in two different foci and unlike the earth and spink one we have not identified any cases uh, we'll see both earth and etv1 in the same tumor foci i think more studies a uh, large um, cohort may reveal the actual incidence of cases with the earth plus and the spink one plus and also dual uh, SV arrangements. I think the audience, uh, I'm sure definitely they'll be interested and go to you, your uh, cohort and uh, I encourage everyone to actually in the large scale screening uh, to uh, estimate the actual frequency of uh, the prostate cancer where you will see the dual molecular aberrations. So it is not only that, <clears throat> we do uh, the screening on the tissue microarray or on small blocks, we may miss some of the cases that reason, I encourage uh, to do this type of analysis on full mount prostate sample. I think it's a common practice in most of the kind of and so when now the whole mount prostate sample out of actually prostate image samples available, I would encourage to do these studies uh, with the presence of even small tumor foci with heterogeneous molecular aberrations. And so, uh, since uh, <clears throat> we are working on to establish the clinical correlation of this new subset of prostate cancer, whether they behave uh, anything differently in terms of actually clinical progression or in terms of response to treatment. I think for the reason, I think this is a very uh, amazing and we are very excited about this meeting. I'm sure uh, the community will also uh, like this uh, approach and uh, they will engage in the study. At this, I will stop uh, my presentation and I will be happy to uh, answer any questions. And I would like to I would acknowledge the people who are involved in the study because none of this work was initially performed at the University of Michigan with the help of uh, Dr. Arun Chunayan and his team and the right and actually uh, continuing the study of the Henry Ford as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Are actually a couple of questions on the line. Uh, one huh? question is how is the reproducibility of the staining on your TA? Do you manage to get positive staining for how Keeping probe in all of your cores. I think roughly slide 21, I believe. I think 21. Let's do that. This is slide 21. You have a question? Can you please repeat that question? Uh, uh, yes. The question is How is the reproducibility of the staining of your TMAs? Do you manage to get positive staining for housekeeping probe in all of your cores? And so it is not only just one TMA <laughs> we are able to screen. I think those are described in the paper as well. This more, I think five or six different TMAs that are representing actually tumors from benign, uh, all different grades, uh, uh, and grade, and also uh, tumors uh, bomb out of the prostate cancer. And it's actually consistently performed very well without any difficulty. Okay. Uh, I have another question that says, have you or anyone else used this method to look at AR levels in prostate biopsies? 
Uh, uh, yes, the so question is, uh, have you used this method to look at AR levels in prostate biopsies? So far, I have not used the RNA probe for AR, but I think there are good antibodies for uh, uh, AR. Um, but we did actually stain uh, these TMAs uh, for, uh, for staining. Yes, we do have the data, but do not include uh, the data uh, in the paper when we report it. So we do have AR standards. Yeah. I think Dr. Ma also is familiar yeah. with some experiments. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to add uh, to that. There's actually, there's this recent uh, paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at the yeah. AR expression. I should look at the specific uh, blood variants AR in prostate cancer that you might want to take a look. Okay. I think after the presentation, one of the links that we'll send out is also to that um, uh, New England Journal of Medicine publication. I believe there was one more slide. One more question. Uh, what is okay? What is the range of quantitation? Uh, Ten copies up to what in the HER2 example, Xiao Jun? So yeah, that's a, a great question. I think uh, for uh, the upper range probably would be different uh, between uh, whether using a chromogenic assay versus a, a, a fluorescence assay. With fluorescence, I think you may be able to uh, detect a uh, higher the uh, higher range, maybe up to uh, 100 copies per cell, a box per cell. And homogenic, I, I think uh, the experience is that you can uh, quantitate up to uh, about 50, 50 uh, Okay, I believe there was one more question, it, a comment. It would be fascinating to use uh, this technology to look at changes in biopsy samples during relapse or primary, um, is that something that you're considering? Exactly, because as I showed you one example that uh, we can perform uh, this RNA on needle biopsy samples as well. So the performance on even actually small biopsies, and also, as I mentioned in one of the slides, there is a clinical trial going on at the University of Michigan where they are using like bone mets biopsy, where we are actually successfully use the this RNA in-situ hybridization to detect the ETV1 positive cases. So yeah, the, any tiny material, as long as there is a, a, a kind of cancer, as especially when you have these tumor biopsies where the amount of tumor may be very small, which is not enough for doing fish, as RNA is, gives a very convincing results by, doing, uh, by, by using suitable positive and negative controls. And uh, actually, Perform several samples of uh, bone mets needle biopsy and also lymph node biopsies, and be able to confirm uh, the ETV1 positive cases. The cases that are positive but ETV1 were eventually confirmed by fish as well. So there is no false positives or false negatives. It is a very good uh, approach. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, one of the questions was more around the assay itself. What's the mechanism for the requirement of three pairs of Z for the visualization of the punctate dots, Xiaoju? Yes. Uh, so the requirement for uh, uh, up to three pairs of Zs to generate a signal is really uh, is a function of uh, how much homogenic uh, product you can uh, make at a site of hybridization that's, that's uh, uh, direct, easily uh, uh, visible. Um, really it's, uh, it is about uh, um, really it's, it reflects the amount of uh, amplification we are uh, getting for each uh, pair of, uh, of double Z and binding. and uh, uh, a single Z, uh, a single pair of Zs basically just do not have enough uh, uh, homogenic uh, uh, at a site to generate a visible dot. Okay. There's another question from Charles Ma, uh, which is, what's the clinical significance for the heterogeneity in the current therapies? Exactly. That is something that uh, that needs more work because this is the first time, you know, we showed the presence of this kind of tumor heterogeneity because until our paper, no one has really actually showed uh, this type of uh, uh, they're like a dual um, like organ spink one or the S gene fusion so far in prostate cancer. Although people have shown things for the P10 uh, being heterogeneous uh, for deletion, 
but it's the first time we show. I, I'm sure there are many more what will follow to estimate the actual incidents and they correlate with the clinical outcome. So we don't have any publications or even from ourselves, we don't have the data. So the work is in progress. I'm sure we, soon we will report uh, the clinical significance of these uh, um, these rearrangement positive cases. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions at this time? Seven minutes over already, so um, I apologize. I think I went a little long when I was uh, introducing. Um, but if you do have any more questions, please do feel free to uh, send it to marketing at acdbio.com, and we can definitely send it to Dr. Pali Nasami and uh, also address the questions ourselves. And I really, really want to thank you for all of you for taking the time to uh, attend today, as well as our uh, guest presenter. Uh, we really appreciate this true application of the technology, and uh, it really is uh, very often that our customers ask the question, can I use this with IHC, should I use RNA scope first, and then IHC, or what's the methodology? And also intratumor as well as intratumor and tumor microenvironments are something that everybody wants to interrogate and ask us a lot of questions about. So I'm very pleased to have an expert who for, uh, also works in pseudogenes and non-coding RNA to use this technology as well. So uh, really appreciate your time and your interest, everyone. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this evening. And also I want to thank ACG Bio uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.